Welcome to Short Stories, Beautiful People Podcast, a production of adventuresinaudio.net. Hello, I'm glad you could visit. And because you're here, you're beautiful people, and I'm grateful. While you're here, be sure to check out other episodes, now over 120 to choose from. Our story today for this episode is by Jack London. We have two other stories by Jack London. One is Zimper Item, published June 16, 2017, and To Build a Fire, published February 8, 2017. The story on this episode is scary in that a man discovers a way to make guns fire remotely. That's right. How would you like to be carrying your concealed carry and it automatically or just surprisingly one day goes off? Yikes. Uh, and, And he goes on a terror, destroying anything containing gunpowder, ships, forts, and he wounded over 100 New York City policemen and all kinds of destruction. He commits murder and much, much more. This this is his way of getting revenge for being mistreated all his life by people that that hated him. And so he goes on this on this revenge. Let's hope that with today's technology nobody comes up with a way to do this. I hope you enjoy The Enemy of All the World by Jack London. It was Silas Bannerman who finally ran down that scientific wizard and arch enemy of mankind, Emil Gluck. Gluck's confession before he went to the electric chair threw much light upon the series of mysterious events, many apparently unrelated, that so perturbed the world between the years of 1933 and 1941. It was not until that remarkable document was made public that the world dreamed of there being any connection between the assassination of the king and queen of Portugal and the murders of the New York City police officers, while the deeds of Emil Gluck were all that was abominable. We cannot but feel, to a certain extent, pity for the unfortunate, malformed, and maltreated genius. This side of his story has never been told before, and from his confession, And from the great mass of evidence and documents and records of the time, we are able to construct a fairly accurate portrait of him and to discern the factors and pressures that molded him into the human monster he became and that drove him onward and downward along the fearful path he trod. Emil Gluck was born in Syracuse, New York in 1895. His father, Joseph Gluck, was a special policeman and night watchman, who in the year 1900 died suddenly of pneumonia. The mother, a pretty, fragile creature, who before her marriage had been a milliner, grieved herself to death over the loss of her husband. The sensitiveness of the mother was the heritage that in the boy became morbid and horrible. In 1901, The boy, Emil, then six years of age, went to live with his aunt, Mrs. Ann Bartell. She was his mother's sister, but in her breast was no kindly feeling for the sensitive, shrinking boy. Ann Bartell was a vain, shallow, and heartless woman. Also, she was cursed with poverty and burdened with a husband who was a lazy, erotic 'er ne'er-do-well. Young Emil Gluck was not wanted and Ann Bartell could be trusted to impress this fact sufficiently upon him. As an illustration of the treatment he received in that early, formative period, the following instance is given. When he had been living in the Bartell home a little more than a year, he broke his leg. He sustained the injury through playing on the forbidden roof, as all boys have done, and will continue to do to the end of time. 
The leg was broken in two places between the knee and the thigh. Emil, helped by his frightened playmates, managed to drag himself to the front sidewalk, where he fainted. The children of the neighborhood were afraid of the hard-featured shrew, who presided over the Bartell house. But summoning their resolution, they rang the bell and told Anne Bartell of the accident. She did not even look at the little lad who lay stricken on the sidewalk but slammed the door and went back to her wash tub. The time passed. A drizzle came on, and Emil Gluck, out of his faint, lay sobbing in the rain. The leg should have been set immediately. As it was, the inflammation rose rapidly and made a nasty case of it. At the end of two hours, the indignant women of the neighborhood protested to Ann Bartell. This time she came out and looked at the lad. Also, she kicked him in the side as he lay helpless at her feet, and she hysterically disowned him. He was not her child, she said, and recommended that the ambulance be called to take him to the city receiving hospital. Then she went back into the house. It was a woman, Elizabeth Shepstone, who came along, learned the situation, and had the boy placed on a shutter. It was she who called the doctor and who, brushing aside Ann Bartell, had the boy carried into the house. When the doctor arrived, Ann Bartell promptly warned him that she would not pay him for his services. For two months, the little emo lay in bed, the first month on his back, without once being turned over, and he lay neglected and alone, save for the occasional visits of the unremunerated and overworked physician. He had no toys, nothing with which to beguile the long and tedious hours. No kind word was spoken to him, no soothing hand laid upon his brow, no single touch or act of loving tenderness, naught but the reproaches and harshness of Anne Bartell and the continually reiterated information that he was not wanted, and it can be well understood in such environment, how there was generated in the lonely, neglected boy much of the bitterness and hostility for his kind that later was to express itself in deeds so frightful as to terrify the world. It would seem strange that from the hands of Ann Bartell, Emo Gluck should have received a college education, but the explanation is simple. Her ne'er do well husband deserted her, made a strike in the Nevada gold fields, and returned to her many times a millionaire. Ann Bartell hated the boy, and immediately she sent him to the Ferris Town Academy, a hundred miles away. Shy and sensitive, a lonely and misunderstood little soul, he was more lonely than ever at Ferris Town. He never came home at vacation and holidays as the other boys did. Instead, he wandered about the deserted buildings and grounds, befriended and misunderstood by the servants and gardeners, reading much. It is remembered spending his days in the fields or before the fireplace, with his nose poked always in the pages of some book. It was at this time that he overused his eyes and was compelled to take up the wearing of glasses, which the same were so prominent in the photographs of him published in the newspapers in 1941. He was a remarkable student. Applications such as his would have taken him far, but he did not need application. A glance at a text meant mastery for him. The result was that he did an immense amount of collateral reading and acquired more in half a year than did the average student in half a dozen years. In 1909, barely 14 years of age, he was ready, more than ready, the headmaster of the academy said, to enter Yale or Harvard. His juvenility prevented him from entering those universities. And so in 1909, we find him a freshman at historic Bowdoin College. In 1913, he graduated with highest honors and immediately afterward followed Professor Bradlow to Berkeley, California. 
The one friend that Emil Gluck discovered in all his life was Professor Bradlow. The latter's weak lungs had led him to exchange Maine for California, the removal being facilitated by the offer of a professorship at the State University. Throughout the year 1914, Emil Gluck resided in Berkeley and took special scientific courses. Toward the end of that year, two deaths changed his prospects and his relations with life. The death of Professor Bradlow took from him the one friend he was ever to know, and the death of Ann Bartell left him penniless, hating the unfortunate lad to the last. She cut him off with one hundred dollars. The following year, at twenty years of age, Emil Gluck was enrolled as an instructor of chemistry in the University of California. Here the years passed quietly. He faithfully performed the drudgery that brought him his salary, and a student always. He took half a dozen degrees. He was, among other things, a doctor of sociology, of philosophy, and of science, though he was known to the world in later days only as Professor Gluck. He was 27 years old when he first sprang into prominence in the newspapers through the publication of his book, Sex and Progress. The book remains today a milestone in the history and philosophy of marriage. It is a heavy tome of over 700 pages, painfully careful and accurate and startlingly original. It was a book for scientists and not one calculated to make a stir, but Gluck in the last chapter, using barely three lines for it, mentioned the hypothetical desirability of trial marriages. At once, the newspapers seized these three lines, played them up yellow, as the slang was in those days, and set the whole world laughing at Emil Gluck, the bespeckled young professor of 27. Photographers snapped him. He was besieged by reporters. Women's clubs throughout the land passed resolutions condemning him and his immoral theories, and on the floor of the California Assembly, while discussing the state appropriation to the university, a motion demanding the expulsion of Gluck was made under threat of withholding the appropriation. Of course, none of his persecutors had read the book. The twisted newspaper version of only three lines of it was enough for them. Here began Emil Gluck's hatred for newspaper men. By them, his serious and intrinsically valuable work of six years had been made a laughing stock and a notoriety. To his dying day, and to their everlasting regret, he never forgave them. It was the newspapers that were responsible for the next disaster that befell him. For the five years following the publication of his book, he remained silent and silence for a lonely man is not good. One can conjecture sympathetically the awful solitude of Emil Gluck in that populous university, for he was without friends and without sympathy. His only recourse was books, and he went on reading and studying enormously. But in 1927, he accepted an invitation to appear before the Human Interest Society of Emeryville, he did not trust himself to speak, and as we write, we have before us a copy of his learned paper. It is sober, scholarly, and scientific, and it must also be added conservative. But in one place he dealt with, and I quote his words, the industrial and social revolution that is taking place in society. A reporter present seized upon the word revolution divorced it from the text, and wrote a garbled account that made Emil Gluck appear an anarchist. At once, Professor Gluck, anarchist, flamed over the wires and was appropriately featured in all the newspapers in the land. He had attempted to reply to the previous newspaper attack, but now he remained silent. Bitterness had already corroded his soul. The university faculty appealed to him to defend himself, but he sullenly declined, even refusing to enter in defense a copy of his paper to save him from expulsion. He refused to resign and was discharged 
from the university faculty. It must be added that political pressure had been put upon the university regents and the president. Persecuted, maligned, and misunderstood, the forlorn and lonely man made no attempt at retaliation. All his life he had been sinned against, and all his life he had sinned against no one. But his cup of bitterness was not yet full to overflowing. Having lost his position, and being without any income, he had to find work. His first place was at the Union Iron Works in San Francisco, where he proved a most able draftsman. It was here that he obtained his first-hand knowledge of battleships and their construction. But the reporters discovered him and featured him in his new vocation. He immediately resigned and found another place. But after the reporters had driven him away from half a dozen positions, he steeled himself to brazen out the newspaper persecution. This occurred when he started his electroplating establishment in Oakland on Telegraph Avenue. It was a small shop employing three men and two boys. Gluck himself worked long hours, night after night, as policeman Carew testified on the stand. He did not leave his shop till one or two in the morning. It was during this period that he perfected the improved ignition device for gas engines, the royalties from which ultimately made him wealthy. He started his electroplating establishment early in the spring of 1928, and it was in the same year that he formed the disastrous love attachment for Irene Tackley. Now, it is not to be imagined that an extraordinary creature such as Emo Gluck could be any other than an extraordinary lover. In addition to his genius, his loneliness, and his morbidness, it must be taken into consideration that he knew nothing about women. Whatever tides of desire flooded his being, he was unschooled in the conventional expression of them, while his excessive timidity was bound to make his lovemaking unusual. Irene Tackley was a rather pretty young woman, but shallow and light-headed. At the time, she worked in a small candy store across the street from Gluck's shop. He used to come in and drink ice cream sodas and lemon squashes and stare at her. It seems the girl did not care for him and merely played with him. He was queer, she said and at another time she called him a crank when describing how he sat at the counter and peered at her through his spectacles, blushing and stammering when she took notice of him, and often leaving the shop in precipitate confusion. Gluck made her the most amazing presents, a silver tea service, a diamond ring, a set of furs, opera glasses, a ponderous history of the world in many volumes and a motorcycle, all silver-plated in his own shop, enters now the girl's lover. Putting his foot down, showing great anger, compelling her to return Gluck's strange assortment of presents. This man, William Sherborne, was a gross and stolid creature, a heavy-jawed man of the working class who had become a successful building contractor in a small way. Gluck did not understand. He tried to get an explanation, attempting to speak with the girl when she went home from work in the evening. She complained to Sherborne, and one night he gave Gluck a beating. It was a severe beating, for it is on the records of the Red Cross Emergency Hospital that Gluck was treated there that night and was unable to leave the hospital for a week. Still, Gluck did not understand he continued to seek an explanation from the girl. In fear of Sherborne, he applied to the chief of police for permission to carry a revolver, which permission was refused, the newspapers, as usual, playing it up sensationally. Then came the murder of Irene Tackley, six days before her contemplated marriage with Sherborne. It was on a Saturday night. She had worked late in the candy store, departing after eleven o'clock with her week's wages in her purse. She rode on a San Pablo Avenue surface car to 34th Street, where she alighted and started to walk the three blocks to her home. 
That was the last seen of her alive. Next morning, she was found strangled in a vacant lot. Emil Gluck was immediately arrested. Nothing that he could do could save him. He was convicted, not merely on circumstantial evidence, but on evidence cooked up by the Oakland police. There is no discussion, but that a large portion of the evidence was manufactured. The testimony of Captain Sheehan was sheerest perjury, it being proved long afterward that on the night in question he had not only not been in the vicinity of the murder, but that he had been out of the city in a resort on the San Leandro Road. The unfortunate Gluck received life imprisonment in San Quentin, while the newspapers and the public held that it was a miscarriage of justice, that the death penalty should have been visited upon him. Gluck entered San Quentin Prison on April 17, 1929. He was then 34 years of age, and for three years and a half, much of the time in solitary confinement, he was left to meditate upon the injustice of man. It was during that period that his bitterness corroded home, and he became a hater of all his kind. Three other things he did during the same period. He wrote his famous treatise, Human Morals, his remarkable brochure, The Criminal Sane, and he worked out his awful and monstrous scheme of revenge. It was an episode that had occurred in his electroplating establishment that suggested to him his unique weapon of revenge. As stated in his confession, he worked every detail out theoretically during his imprisonment and was able, on his release, immediately to embark on his career of vengeance. His release was sensational. Also, it was miserably and criminally delayed by the soulless legal red tape then in vogue. On the night of February 1, 1932, Tim Haswell, a hold-up man, was shot during an attempted robbery by a citizen of Piedmont Heights. Tim Haswell lingered three days, during which time he not only confessed to the murder of Irene Tackley, but furnished conclusive proofs of the same. Bert Daniker, a convict dying of consumption in Folsom Prison, was implicated as accessory and his confession followed. It is inconceivable to us today the bungling, dilatory processes of justice a generation ago. Emil Gluck was proved in February to be an innocent man, yet he was not released until the following October. For eight months, a greatly wronged man was compelled to undergo his unmerited punishment. This was not conducive to sweetness and light, and we can well imagine how he ate his soul with bitterness during these dreary eight months. He came back to the world in the fall of 1932, as usual, a feature topic in all the newspapers. The papers, instead of expressing heartfelt regret, continued their old sensational persecution. One paper did more, the San Francisco Intelligencer. John Hartwell, its editor, elaborated an ingenious theory that got around the confessions of the two criminals and went to show that Gluck was responsible, after all, for the murder of Irene Tackley. Hartwell died, and Sherborne died, too, while Policeman Phillips was shot in the leg and discharged from the Oakland police force. The murder of Hartwell was long a mystery. He was alone in his editorial office at the time. The reports of the revolver were heard by the office boy, who rushed in to find Hartwell expiring in his chair. What puzzled the police was the fact not merely that he had been shot with his own revolver, but that the revolver had been exploded in the drawer of his desk. The bullets had torn through the front of the drawer and entered his body. The police scouted the theory of suicide. Murder was dismissed as absurd, and the blame was thrown upon the Eureka Smokeless Cartridge Company.
spontaneous explosion was the police explanation, and the chemists of the cartridge company were bullied at the inquest. But what the police did not know was that across the street, in the Mercer Building, room 633, rented by Emil Gluck, had been occupied by Emil Gluck at the very moment Hartwell's revolver so mysteriously exploded. At the time, no connection was made between Hartwell's death and the death of William Sherborne. Sherborne had continued to live in the home he built for Irene Tackley, and one morning in January 1933, he was found dead. Suicide was the verdict of the coroner's inquest, for he had been shot by his own revolver. The curious thing that happened that night was the shooting of policeman Phillips on the sidewalk in front of Sherborne's house. The policeman crawled to a police telephone on the corner and rang up for an ambulance. He claimed that someone had shot him from behind in the leg. The leg in question was so badly shattered by three thirty-eight caliber bullets that amputation was necessary. But when the police discovered that the damage had been done by his own revolver, a great laugh went up, and he was charged with having been drunk. In spite of his denial of having touched a drop, and of his persistent assertion that the revolver had been in his hip pocket, and that he had not laid a finger to it, he was discharged from the force. Emil Gluck's confession six years later cleared the unfortunate policeman of disgrace, and he is alive today and in good health, the recipient of a handsome pension from the city. Emil Gluck, having disposed of his immediate enemies, now sought a wider field, though his enmity for newspaper men and the police remained always active. The royalties on his ignition device for gasoline engines had mounted up while he lay in prison, and year by year the earning power of his invention increased. He was independent, able to travel wherever he willed over the earth and to glut his monstrous appetite for revenge. He had become a monomaniac and an anarchist, not a philosophic anarchist merely, but a violent anarchist. Perhaps the word is misused, and he is better described as a nihilist, or a nihilist. It is known that he affiliated with none of the groups of terrorists. He operated wholly alone, but he created a thousandfold more terror, and achieved a thousandfold more destruction than all the terrorist groups added together. He signalized his departure from California by blowing up Fort Mason. In his confession, he spoke of it as a little experiment. He was merely trying his hand. For eight years, he wandered over the earth, a mysterious terror, destroying property to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars and destroying countless lives. One good result of his awful deeds was the destruction he wrought among the terrorists themselves. Every time he did anything, the terrorists in the vicinity were gathered in by the police dragnet, and many of them were executed. Seventeen were executed at Rome alone, following the assassination of the Italian king. Perhaps the most amazing achievement of his was the assassination of the king and queen of Portugal. It was their wedding day. All possible precautions had been taken against the terrorists, and the way from the cathedral through Libson Street was double-banked with troops, while a squad of two hundred mounted troopers surrounded the carriage. Suddenly, the amazing thing happened. The automatic rifles of the troopers began to go off, as well as the rifles in the immediate vicinity of the double-banked infantry. In the excitement, the muzzles of the exploding rifles were turned in all directions. The slaughter was terrible. Horses, troops, spectators, and the king and queen were riddled with bullets. To complicate the affair, in different parts of the crowd behind the foot soldiers, two terrorists had bombs explode on their persons. These bombs they had intended to throw if they got the opportunity, 
But who was to know this? The frightful havoc wrought by the bursting bombs but added to the confusion. It was considered part of the general attack. One puzzling thing that could not be explained away was the conduct of the troopers with their exploding rifles. It seemed impossible that they should be in the plot, yet there were the hundreds their flying bullets had slain, including the king and queen. On the other hand, more baffling than ever was the fact that 70% of the troopers themselves had been killed or wounded. Some explained this on the ground, that the loyal foot soldiers, witnessing the attack on the royal carriage, had opened fire on the traitors. Yet not one bit of evidence to verify this could be drawn from the survivors, though many were put to the torture. They contended stubbornly that they had not discharged their rifles at all, but that their rifles had discharged themselves. They were laughed at by the chemist, who held that while it was just barely probable that a single cartridge charged with the new smokeless powder might spontaneously explode, it was beyond all probability and possibility for all the cartridges in a given area so charged spontaneously to explode. And so in the end, no explanation of the amazing occurrence was reached. The general opinion of the rest of the world was that the whole affair was a blind panic of the feverish Latins precipitated, it was true, by the bursting of two terrorist bombs. And in this connection was recalled the laughable encounter of long years before between the Russian fleet and the English fishing boats. And Emil Gluck chuckled and went on his way. He knew. But how was the world to know? He had stumbled upon the secret in his old electroplating shop on Telegraph Avenue in the city of Oakland. It happened at that time that a wireless telegraph station was established by the Thurston Power Company close to his shop. In a short time, his electroplating vat was put out of order. The vat wiring had many bad joints, and on investigation, Gluck discovered minute welds at the joints in the wiring. These, by lowering the resistance, had caused an excessive current to pass through the solution, boiling it and spoiling the work. But what had caused the welds was the question in Gluck's mind. His reasoning was simple. Before the establishment of the wireless station, the vat had worked well. Not until after the establishment of the wireless station had the vat been ruined. Therefore, the wireless station had been the cause. But how? He quickly answered the question. If an electric discharge was capable of operating a coherer across 3,000 miles of ocean, then certainly the electric discharges from the wireless station 400 feet away could produce coherer effects on the bad joints in the vat wiring. Gluck thought no more about it at the time. He merely rewired his vat and went on electroplating. But afterwards in prison, he remembered the incident, and like a flash there came into his mind the full significance of it. He saw it in the silent secret weapon with which to revenge himself on the world. His great discovery, which died with him, was control over the direction and scope of the electric discharge. At the time, this was the unsolved problem of wireless telegraphy, as it still is today. But Emil Gluck, in his prison cell, mastered it, and when he was released, he applied it. It was fairly simple, given the directing power that was his to introduce a spark into the powder magazines of a fort, a battleship, or a revolver. And not alone could he thus explode powder at a distance, but he could ignite conflagrations. The great Boston fire was started by him, quite by accident, however, as he stated in his confession, adding that it was a pleasing accident and that he never had any reason to regret it.
It was Emil Gluck that caused the terrible German-American War, with the loss of 800,000 lives and the consumption of almost incalculable treasure. It will be remembered that in 1939, because of the Pickard incident, strained relations existed between the two countries. Germany, though aggrieved, was not anxious for war and, as a peace token, sent the crown prince and seven battleships on a friendly visit to the United States. On the night of February 15, the seven warships lay at anchor in the Hudson opposite New York City. On that night, Emil Gluck alone, with all his apparatus on board, was out in a launch. This launch, it was afterwards proved, was bought by him from the Ross Turner Company. While much of the apparatus he used that night had been purchased from the Columbia Electric Works, but this was not known at the time. All that was known at the time was that seven battleships blew up, one after another, at regular four-minute intervals. Ninety percent of the crews and officers, along with the Crown Prince, perished. Many years before, The American battleship Maine had been blown up in the harbor of Havana, and war with Spain had immediately followed. Though there was always existed a reasonable doubt as to whether the explosion was due to conspiracy or accident. But accident could not explain the blowing up of the seven battleships on the Hudson at four-minute intervals. Germany believed that it had been done by a submarine and immediately declared war. It was six months after Gluck's confession that she returned the Philippines and Hawaii to the United States. In the meanwhile, Emil Gluck, the malevolent wizard and arch-hater, traveled his whirlwind path of destruction. He left no traces. Scientifically thorough, he always cleaned up after himself. His method was to rent a room or a house and secretly to install his apparatus, which apparatus, by the way, he so perfected and simplified that it occupied little space. After he had accomplished his purpose, he carefully removed the apparatus, he bade fair to live out a long life of horrible crime. The epidemic of shooting of New York City policemen was a remarkable affair, It became one of the horror mysteries of the time. In two short weeks, over a hundred policemen were shot in the legs by their own revolvers. Inspector Jones did not solve the mystery, but it was his idea that finally outwitted Gluck. On his recommendation, the policemen ceased carrying revolvers, and no more accidental shootings occurred. It was in the early spring of 1940 that Gluck destroyed the Mare Island Navy Yard. From a room in Vallejo, he sent his electric discharges across the Vallejo Straits to Mare Island. He first played his flashes on the battleship Maryland. She lay at the dock of one of the mine magazines. On her forward deck, a huge temporary platform of timbers were disposed over a hundred mines. These mines were for the defense of the Golden Gate. Any one of these mines was capable of destroying a dozen battleships, and there were over a hundred mines. The destruction was terrific, but it was only Gluck's overture. He played his flashes down the Mare Island shore, blowing up five torpedo boats, the torpedo station, and the great magazine at the eastern end of the island. Returning westward again and scooping in occasional isolated magazines on the high ground back from the shore, he blew up three cruisers and the battleships Oregon, Delaware, New Hampshire, and Florida. The latter had just gone into dry dock, and the magnificent dry dock was destroyed along with her. It was a frightful catastrophe and a shiver of horror passed through the land, but it was nothing to what was to follow. In the late fall of that year, Emo Gluck made a clean sweep of the Atlantic seaboard from Maine to Florida. Nothing escaped. 
forts, mines, coast defenses of all sorts, torpedo stations, magazines, everything went up. Three months afterward in midwinter, he smote the north shore of the Mediterranean from Gibraltar to Greece in the same stupefying manner. A wail went up from the nations. It was clear that human agency was behind all this destruction, and it was equally clear through Emil Gluck's impartiality that the destruction was not the work of any particular nation. One thing was patent, namely, that whoever was the human behind it all, that human was a menace to the world. No nation was safe. There was no defense against this unknown and all-powerful foe. Warfare was futile. Nay, not merely futile, but itself the very essence of the peril. For a twelve-month, the manufacture of powder ceased, and all soldiers and sailors were withdrawn from all fortifications and war vessels. And even a world disarmament was seriously considered at the Convention of the Powers held at The Hague at that time. And then Silas Bannerman, a Secret Service agent of the United States, leaped into world fame by arresting Emil Gluck. At first Bannerman was laughed at, but he had prepared his case well, and in a few weeks the most skeptical were convinced of Emil Gluck's guilt. The one thing, however, that Silas Bannerman never succeeded in explaining, even to his own satisfaction, was how first he came to connect Gluck with the atrocious crimes. It is true Bannerman was in Vallejo on secret government business at the time of the destruction of Mare Island, and it is true that on the streets of Vallejo, Emil Gluck was pointed out to him as a queer crank. But no impression was made at the time. It was not until afterward, when on vacation in the Rocky Mountains, and when reading the first published reports of the destruction along the Atlantic coast, that suddenly Bannerman thought of Emil Gluck and on the instant there flashed into his mind the connection between Gluck and the destruction. It was only an hypothesis, but it was sufficient. The great thing was the conception of the hypothesis, in itself an act of unconscious cerebration, a thing as unaccountable as the flashing, for instance, into Newton's mind of the principle of gravitation. The rest was easy. Where was Gluck at the time of the destruction along the Atlantic seaboard was the question that formed in Bannerman's mind. By his own request, he was put upon the case. In no time, he ascertained that Gluck had himself been up and down the Atlantic coast in the late fall of 1940. Also, he ascertained that Gluck had been in New York City during the epidemic of the shooting of police officers. Where was Gluck now? was Bannerman's next query, and, as if in answer, came the wholesale destruction along the Mediterranean. Gluck had sailed for Europe a month before. Bannerman knew that. It was not necessary for Bannerman to go to Europe. By means of cable messages and the cooperation of the European Secret Services, he traced Gluck's course along the Mediterranean and found that in every instance it coincided with the blowing up of coast defenses and ships. Also, he learned that Gluck had just sailed on the Green Star liner Plutonic for the United States. The case was complete in Bannerman's mind, though in the interval of waiting he worked up the details. In this, he was ably assisted by George Brown, an operator employed by Wood's system of wireless telegraphy. When the Plutonic arrived off Sandy Hook, she was boarded by Bannerman from a government tug, and Emil Gluck was made a prisoner. The trial and the confession followed. In the confession, Gluck professed regret only for one thing, namely, that he had taken his time. As he said, had he dreamed that he was ever to be discovered, 
he would have worked more rapidly and accomplished a thousand times the destruction he did. His secret died with him, though it is now known that the French government managed to get access to him and offered him a billion francs for his invention, wherewith he was able to direct and closely to confine electric discharges. What? was Gluck's reply. To sell you that which would enable you to enslave and maltreat suffering humanity? And though the war departments of the nations have continued to experiment in their secret laboratories, they have so far failed to light upon the slightest trace of the secret. Emil Gluck was executed on December 4, 1941, and so died at the age of 46, one of the world's most unfortunate geniuses, a man of tremendous intellect but whose mighty powers, instead of making toward good, were so twisted and warped that he became the most amazing of criminals. You've been listening to The Enemy of All the World by Jack London, who once said, I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy, permanent planet. I'm Robert Cranley. I've enjoyed being with you, but now I must go. But I hope to be with you again soon. Please be well, and thank you for listening to me. (laughs) ¶¶